Thank you and welcome to this year's uh, My OER Summit. We're so glad that you're here. Um, but before we start, I would just like to honor the land in which the Michigan OER Summit resides. The state of Michigan occupies the, the ancestral traditional and contemporary lands of the Ashinabek Three Fires Confederacy, the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Bo Bodewadni. We recognize the historic indigenous communities in Michigan and those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. We further recognize the ongoing relationship of dependence upon and respect for all living beings of earth, sky, and water. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. This year's conference would not be possible without um, our awesome members of the Michigan um, OER Steering Committee and the Conference Planning Committee. So thank you everyone for all the work that you've done leading up to this day. Um, we also want to thank our sponsors and partners for this year, uh, the Midwestern Higher Education Compact, the, Insti the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and the Library of Michigan. We, we want to thank you all for your dedication and commitment to making open education um, open for all. And we have a great slate of programming for today and tomorrow. Um, so today's keynote, of course, as you know, would be Nicole Allen, and tomorrow would be um, Mahabali. And um, we hope you enjoy and find inspiration in the sessions that you will be attending. Thank you to all our presenters for today and tomorrow. Your presence in this summit is much appreciated. Um, as uh, my colleague Katie said, if you have any questions, please type it in the Q&A box and we will answer it um, either live or we'll type the answer um, for you. Okay, so now for our keynote. Nicole Allen needs no introduction. She's a pillar in the open education community, but to me, she is a friend, a valued colleague, and someone who has got my back, and I got hers too. Um, and I am so immensely grateful for that. Her work as director of open education at Spark has brought about impactful change that helped all of us advance and champion OER at the local, state, national, and international level. I'm so excited for her keynote and for being here in spite of everything she has gone through this past um, week. Basically, she would just tell us a story this, that speaks to this year's theme of looking back and looking forward. So without further ado, I'm here to introduce our dear friend, Nicole Allen. Nicole. Thanks so much, Regina. It's an honor to be here. And I'm so grateful for the invitation to give this talk because I feel like the conference theme this year is really timely and something that that I have some things to say about. So the, the talk I'm gonna give here today is called Open Education Advocacy, Past, Present, and Future. And I'm gonna give this talk by telling my story as an open education advocate, starting back from when I started with the open education movement as an undergraduate student in the mid 2000s and bringing us up until today and, and sort of some of the challenges that the field is facing and then thinking ahead to the future and some of the things that, that, that I'm thinking about as a member of this field and where the future can go. 
So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides and just let me know if uh, there are any issues with that. Um, so we're going to start by going back to 2005 when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. And uh, I got involved during my senior year in advocacy around the high cost of college. I was very fortunate. Uh, I didn't experience any challenges affording college, but you know, all of the students around me were struggling. And uh, I became really passionate about uh, some, uh, something that Congress was trying to do. So this was you know, 2005, it was the Bush administration. And there was the so-called raid on student aid proposed as part of the Bush tax cuts. They were gonna take uh, billions of dollars away from federal student aid in order to fund the Bush tax cuts. And uh, I just thought it was wrong. You know, students were struggling to pay for higher education and you know, here's Congress <laughs> trying to make it even harder. So as a student in Washington state, I ended up mobilizing a campaign working with students all across the state to try to stop the raid on student aid. And uh, a lot of the work that we ended up doing was focus around uh, a single congressperson. His name's uh, Dave Reichert. He retired a couple of years ago, uh, but he was a moderate Republican and like a key swing vote on this bill. And for months and months, we were working, uh, uh, holding rallies and getting petitions, getting college presidents involved, uh, trying to, to get this one guy to flip his vote. <laughs> um, and there's a really sort of transformative moment that set me on the trajectory that my career is on. Um, and I still remember the day, this is a picture of uh, all of us we were a group of students. We were outside uh, Congressman Reichert's office in, in Mercer Island, Washington. Of course, it's Seattle, so it's pouring rain. We had to cover our, our posters with packing tape uh, so they wouldn't fall apart. And, uh, you know, we were out there, um, you know, calling on the congressman to flip his vote. Like, literally, it was going to come down to a single vote could change the outcome of the bill. And uh, I remember the moment we, we were standing there and somebody comes out of his office and asks to speak with the organizer of the rally. And at that point, it, it didn't really occur to me that that like <laughs> that was me. <laughs> um, and I had this like, oh, crap moment where I was like, am I in trouble? But what actually happened is that the staff person brought me upstairs to the congressman's office and put me on the phone with the congressman. He'd stepped off the floor of the US House of Representatives to you know, the day before a massive vote uh, to speak with me. And he talked to me for 30 minutes and heard what I had to say about the state of higher education, how textbooks cost too much, how student loan debt was a massive problem. And uh, it was sort of at that moment that it sort of, it, it, it really hit me that the student voice is so important. And really if students use their voices, we can have an impact. And uh, the next day when Congress voted, um, he didn't vote with us. <laughs> Ultimately, I didn't change anything. Uh, and I think, when I look back on it, like having a loss this early in my career and, and sort of going through that process of, of, you know, getting to the like, getting to the guy who could make the decision and, and speaking with him and then ultimately not <laughs> winning was really, I think it was really helpful for me because it helped me understand just how big the systems were operating within. And that even though you may not win right away, you actually can have an impact in the long run. And the work of advocacy lays the groundwork that actually does change things in the future. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, I continued to build a relationship with the congressman and it, when Congress flipped in 2006 and there was new legislation introduced to reform the student loan system, making it better for students, uh, I actually was able to convince the congressman to be a vote 
in support of passing uh, a really important student loan reform. So that work really did lead to an impact in the long run. So it was sort of at that moment that I decided that I wanted to go into a career in advocacy. And it was also around that time that, that I started thinking about just like how big the system is for paying for college and higher education. And that even though we can pass these bills, we can find money to, to, to pay, uh, help offset costs. Ultimately, it's about the cost of higher education, not just reducing the price that students are paying. And this realization to me was, was really important. And it's what led me to be working on the issue of textbook costs. And many of us have you know, seen this statistic from, from the College Board showing the, the, the overall student budgets for higher education and you know, books and supplies is the little gray stripe. Um, and it's not the largest cost that students are facing, but it is the one that we literally have solutions for. And you know, back then, this is the mid 2000s, the open education movement hadn't quite <laughs> gotten uh, to the level that it is today. Uh, but there was this idea out there of um, you know, freely sharing information online. You know, I grew up in the internet age. I, I didn't understand why my textbooks were so expensive when we can freely access basically unlimited information online. So I got involved with uh, an organization called the Student Purgs and they were running a campaign called Make Textbooks Affordable that was all about helping students reduce textbook costs through used books and rental programs. Uh, we produced a ton of research uh, that helped highlight the astronomical cost of higher education and specifically the outrageous skyrocketing costs of college textbooks, which is a problem that was just really starting to heat, heat up back then. And that was 2007. And then in 2008, the Cape Town Declaration was published, which was sort of the, uh, I guess, galvanizing moment for the open education movement. And things really started to take off. You know, it starts with this phrase, we are on the cusp of a global revolution in, in teaching and learning. And I encourage, if you haven't heard of this or haven't read it in a while, really encourage you to go check this out because I think in many ways, it's still very relevant today, even though we're, we're almost 15 years later. And back at the time, the kinds of OER projects that were out there were things like MIT Open Courseware, uh, and you know you can tell that this is the mid two thousands because of these websites. Um, Connections, which was uh, the uh, original uh, repository that that I guess birthed OpenStax <clears throat> at Rice University. I apologize for for any coughing. I'm actually recovering from COVID <laughs> right now. Um, give me a minute. Uh, Merlot, uh, this is what Merlot looked like. This is still around today. So it was lots of repositories of, of little pieces of OER at the time. And uh, the Student Perks launched a campaign with the support of the Hewlett Foundation to mobilize students to advocate for open educational resources. And, you know, I went into this thinking, like, we're just going to go and get faculty to see that it, you know, there's all this free stuff out there. They should just be using that rather than expensive traditional textbooks. It turned out to be a little bit more complicated than that. Um, so we launched a campaign that was focused specifically on open textbooks. And I actually went back and pulled up some of our materials. And I thought this was really funny. This was from our campaign plan. And this was, you know, 2008. And the first thing that we did is we went out there and, and tried to find all of the open textbooks. And you know how many we found? Five. <laughs> Today, there's over a thousand list, listed in the, in the uh, open textbook library and, and many more aside from that. And many coming from the state of Michigan. But back then there was only five. <laughs> and with those five examples of open textbooks, we were able to organize a student campaign to get professors to sign on to a statement endorsing the idea of an open textbook saying that, you know, if we could 
actually get more of these freely available openly licensed resources that are available both online and in print, we would use them as long as they're of comparable quality. And initially it was a thousand professors from 300 campuses who signed this, but uh, this number uh, more than tripled over the next couple of years. But this effort actually helped launch the idea of open textbooks into the national media. And over that summer, there were articles in basically every major news outlet in the US talking about this idea of open textbooks. You know, USA Today, New York Times, uh, Time, Wall Street Journal, Marketplace, Wired. And this uh, momentum over the course of the summer was actually successful in getting a, a key piece of legislation inserted into the big higher education package of, of legislation passed in, in late 2008 that actually many of you may be familiar with on your campuses, which is the textbook price disclosure requirements and ordering a GAO report that, uh, that would look at the cost of textbooks and the need for transparency. So uh, all of this momentum behind open textbooks and uh, transparency in textbook pricing really launched the, the narrative about textbook costs for the next, I guess, decade or so. <laughs> And the narrative was so much simpler, you know, it was just very obvious back then it was, uh, you could use these expensive traditional textbooks that have been increasing astronomically for many years, or use these freely available open textbooks and open educational resources that are sort of the only alternative. You know, there were five major publishers holding 90% of the market. This is still about the same. Uh, three major publishers hold about 80% of the market right now. Uh, you know, this, this dynamic of, of students are a captive market. It, it, it's professors who decide what students ultimately have to buy. Uh, and because of that, publishers are able to increase prices uh, basically with abandon and there were all of these examples of these textbooks. Uh, you know, this is from 2007. Uh, Mankey's economics was $167, which was wild back then. This went up to $400 by two, 2017. So the narrative was very simple and it was ultimately about students can't learn from books they can't afford. And over the course of this time, the student perks and the student campaign I worked with engaged in all sorts of efforts to get the word out. You know, we developed a list of open textbooks and organized action days to go out and, and meet with faculty and uh, let them know about open textbooks that were in their subject as the list started to grow. As it grew even more, the student perks, we launched uh, the first sort of uh, beta version of an open textbook catalog that listed uh, open textbooks with all of their uh, information, just like a textbook publisher catalog would, and, and had faculty write reviews of these books, which is a strategy that many of you may be familiar with today because it's still very effective. In 2011, we launched a campaign called the Textbook Rebellion, <laughs> where we drove these two giant mascot costumes across the country. We went to 40 campuses, started in uh, Mass or started in DC, went up to Massachusetts, went across the country to the Midwest, to Denver, down to Arizona, and then up the West Coast. We had this van <laughs> that we brought to the campuses and, and organized students on each of the campuses we went to, to gather petition signatures that we then used to mobilize outreach to faculty. And uh, this was such an important time because it really brought this idea of the expensive traditional textbook before versus the new idea of open educational resources, the textbook rebel, uh, as the, uh, how the times were changing. 
And this was covered widely in, in the media by, you know, at the start of the trip, uh, we started to get articles and by the end of it, people were, were recognizing us on campus. And it generated uh, over 10,000 uh, direct contacts between students and faculty promoting open textbooks. And I think it was this time that, that just OER advocacy really hit our stride. Uh, at this time, the University of Minnesota launched the Open Textbook Library, which of course is an outstanding tool to share with faculty and to find uh, freely available open textbooks. Uh, during this time, there was a sort of a big shift, Flat World Knowledge, which was originally the open textbook publisher that, that, that served as a super proof of concept for the idea of open educational resources. They decided to stop being open, but within uh, just a few months, I think, uh, Rice University launched OpenStax which as many of you know now has become to be uh, grown to become one of the uh, largest open tech or the largest textbook publishers in the country, one of the largest textbook publishers in the country. And it was around this time around 2013 when libraries really started to become a vital part of the open education movement. You know, of course, libraries have always been involved in, in open access and promoting open research and uh, even helping students get access to textbooks through library reserves. But it was really in 2013 when libraries became uh, or started to become the central force that they are now. And it was also in 2013 when uh, I started working for Spark. <laughs> I moved from working with students to working with libraries and uh, have since worked to uh, build a, a very large policy program out of Spark. So we've introduced legislation in the last five Congresses that would create a federally funded grant program permanently for open textbooks and required national uh, open education course marking standards. This hasn't passed yet and probably is going to be a, a number of years before it is. But uh, this has laid the foundation for a number of ad advances at the policy level. In 2015, a group of over 100 organizations signed on to a letter calling on, on President Obama to commit to open education and open licensing for federally funded educational resources in our national open government plan. And uh, in fact, that happened. Uh, the, for the first time, the uh, White House issued a document that stated these words that the United States is committed to the idea of open educational resources, which I think was really, really helpful in, in, in galvanizing campuses and state governments and in, in promoting these issues. Uh, it really helped the, the student movement grow on campuses and it helped support a number of states to invest in open educational resources. This is from Spark State Policy Playbook that talks about how some of these pieces of legislation are uh, shaping OER initiatives in states, you know, everything from uh, massive investments in zero textbook cost degree programs out of California uh, to some textbook course marking legislation in states like Texas and Oregon uh, to larger state funded initiatives in New York and uh, Louisiana. And uh, as many of you know, uh, the, this has also laid the groundwork for significant action in Congress, getting over $5 million uh, committed, or $5 million committed to the Open Textbook Pilot Federal Grant Program in, in fiscal year 2018, which has been renewed every year since then and is on track to be renewed at at least $10 million again this year. So the movement really hit. Uh, a stride over the course of the uh, early to mid uh, 20, uh, 2010s. And 
this narrative of saving students money, affordability, OER versus expensive traditional textbooks was really the core driver of that, you know, belief in, in equity and making sure that, that students have better alternatives. But it was in 2017, really, that things started to shift in the way that we talk about OER. And these are some of the challenges that, that I'm gonna talk about as we look ahead to the present and the future. So in 2017, we started to see the publishing industry change the way that they talk about textbooks and change the way that they're promoting their digital resources. Of course, the idea of e-textbook subscriptions has been around since the uh, early or the late 2000s. I think they launched their first ebook marketplace called CourseMart in 2008. But the ebooks of the past were really set up to be uh, uh, very limited, limited access, short-term access, and the pricing was uh, much higher than a lot of the digital resources that you'll see today. And the shift in the way that the publishers started talking about their materials was really about offering these digital materials that cost less than traditional textbooks. You do see, uh, initially we saw a little bit of this from Pearson where they started to attack the affordability narrative and say, you know, actually these textbooks should be this expensive because they're better than this idea of free materials, but that quickly stopped. <laughs> and we started to see things like this from Cengage, for example, one of the other large publishers, you know, using the kinds of statistics that we had been using about the impact of the cost of textbooks to, to try to promote and sell their digital resources that appear at least to save students money and be at a lower cost. And this is actually a screenshot of a deleted tweet, but it, I think it, it really underscores the uh, tone deafness of the um, uh, of the way that the industry approached this in terms of using statistics like students experiencing food insecurity because of the cost of textbooks to promote their own products, even though this industry was complicit in creating the situation in the first place. We also saw around this time the textbook publishing industry start to appear <laughs> to offer open resources. And I think the, the most visible example of this is Cengage's Open Now program, which packaged up a bunch of open educational resources inside their platform and uh, sold uh, access to the, the, the platform. Of course, you know, it's OER once you get in it. <laughs> But, uh, you know, that received a lot of critiques, uh, but I, um, I believe some of these products are still available today and a number of the other publishers launched uh, similar products. And we started to see the, the kinds of press releases that, you know, many of our OER initiatives, uh, many of you who, who have OER initiatives have likely sent out yourselves about how much money you've saved <laughs> students. We saw McGraw-Hill, another big publisher, put out a headline like this. We've saved students more than $55 million in 2018 by charging them for digital materials instead of print materials. We also see co-opting of tactics like this, like how many of, of your campuses have organized efforts of having students share, you know, the impact of the cost of textbooks that, that it's had on them and what the high costs they've paid could help them do, you know, buy groceries, take an extra class, uh, buy clothing. But we saw this sponsored ad by Cengage of using the exact same tactic promoting one of their digital products that just charges students for something else. And by 2018-2019, we saw the Association of American Publishers, which is the trade association representing the publishing industry that you know has long denied that textbook costs are a problem finally sort of start 
issuing headlines like this, like, you know, our publishers, of course, offer OER and support the idea of OER and are working to save students money. So this is what administrators are hearing on campus and what faculty are hearing on campus from the publishing industry and even policymakers too. And it was also at the beginning of, of sort of this phase where this idea of inclusive access took off. And this term, you know, we've all heard it. <clears throat> it refers to automatically charging students a fee for access to course materials when they enroll in a course. And we've seen this really proliferate as something that the publishing industry has offered, perhaps as an answer to OER, because in many ways it, it appears to do the same things. It appears to lower costs, it appears to provide day one access for all students, and it appears to offer them a choice between accessing materials digitally and paying extra to get a print copy. But as we've seen this roll out, you know, we've seen the, the, you know, the, the term inclusive access is a misnomer. It's, it's not making education more inclusive. And, and we've seen them start using these terms like equitable access to refer to a flat fee uh, for, for textbooks, uh, which also is a misnomer. Having students all pay equally does not <laughs> equate to making things more equitable. Um, but we're starting to see more attention and understanding that these programs, you know, may uh, offer some savings in some cases, but in in some ways they are actually inequitable in the sense that the, the students who are saving money are the ones who would have otherwise paid full price or paid for a print textbook. Whereas the students who would have otherwise shopped around for used books, rented, borrowed, used the library are the ones that may actually end up paying more than they would have otherwise, which is, which is the opposite of equitable. And uh, moreover, a lot of the implementation challenges and pushback we're seeing on, on college campuses as they start to understand uh, the real administrative cost of, the, of these types of programs. Alongside inclusive access, we've also seen things like this come, come out of the, the traditional publishing industry. You know, Pearson launching a $15 subscription service for college textbook, which is an awesome headline. But uh, when you actually understand the fine print of this, it's, it's actually, it's $15 a month and it's for one textbook, which works out to be about $40, which is really not that cheap. <laughs> And, uh, you know, trying, like, I think the goal is to try to make textbooks seem like Netflix or Hulu and the kinds of things that students are, are, are spending their money on. Uh, you know, if you look at Pearson's website, it even looks like, it looks a little bit like Netflix. And I think this is really muddy in the waters in terms of what students are actually experiencing and, and, and paying, you know, a, a $14.99 uh, subscription for, for textbooks is actually a lot of money. <laughs> and especially when you consider that Pearson is only one publisher. Uh, Cengage offers a, a similar product and in fact uh, launched it earlier than Pearson, quite a bit earlier than Pearson called Cengage Unlimited, where students get unlimited access and, you know, their pricing is, $69.99 for four months. These prices might be a little bit old. Uh, or, you know, $124 for courseware access. And this is creating all sorts of new questions that, you know, we're going to need to navigate as higher ed about the amount of data that publishers are able to capture through the use of these digital materials and how. Uh, the shift to inclusive access is essentially forcing students to use digital materials and forcing institutions and faculty to start adopting these kinds of materials and the courseware that comes with it, uh, perhaps without fully understanding the implications for privacy, for the company's future plans, for the use of the data that's gathered through these materials, you know, even understanding that, that, that most of it would be protected by, by FERPA. So I, I think there's a lot of questions that, that higher ed just needs to be thinking about deeply as, as this happens. And that has become a little bit 
part of the narrative and the advocacy that certainly Spark and others have been doing, but I think not, not enough, <laughs> something we need to pay attention to. So this all brings us to where we are now which is open education at a crossroads. This is the present. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the present in the context of a recent report issued by Bayview Analytics uh, in looking at some of the statistics that uh, are published in this report. And, and I will share these slides and, and, and links to the report uh, after the session. So one of the things that we know from this data is that open educational resources awareness has dramatically increased. So at the start of this talk, we were at pretty much zero, <laughs> zero levels of awareness. And we've reached the point where strict, by the strictest definition that this research uses, over half of faculty in the US have some level of awareness of open educational resources and in fact, 23% are very aware of OER. And this has increased very steadily over the last uh, six years, six, seven years. <clears throat> the other thing that we know from this research is that OER initiatives work. This graph shows the difference between faculty awareness of OER or faculty adoption of OER at campuses where faculty are aware of an OER initiative <laughs> and those that aren't. So if there's an OER initiative on your OER initiative on your campus, it's much more likely faculty are going to be using OER. So all of the amazing work to do mini grant programs and workshops and librarians working to curate and identify materials for faculty, it's working. And it's and we've come an extraordinarily long way. You know, statistics like this, faculty use of OER materials. If we look at introductory courses, we're starting to see, you know, close to a third of faculty are saying that they use it as a required material. That's amazing. That's that's really incredible, incredible pro progress. And when I think, I think back to 2008, this is like beyond what I even imagined we could accomplish as a movement. But we're also seeing some challenges. <laughs> so one of them is this growth of inclusive access. And the use of inclusive access is roughly uh, reaching the level of adoption that, that, that OER is in, in some courses. And the other thing is that even though OER adoption is really growing and growing dramatically, it is growing at a relatively linear rate of about three percentage points per year. And thinking about what this rate le looks like as we look ahead, you know, 10, 20 years in the future, it is gonna take about 10 years until, you know, we reach that 50% that point where, you know, 50% of faculty are using an OER in at least one course. Obviously, you know, this is <laughs> all caveats about the extrapolation on this, but I think it's a helpful illustration of understanding the pace of growth and the movement has come an extraordinarily long way, but there's still a long way to go. And I think something that keeps me up at night a little bit is this statistic, just looking at how things have changed, especially since the pandemic, about what kind of materials faculty are using. And I think this top part here about homework systems is, is, is really significant and something that I think likely resonates that uh, there's been an enormous jump in the faculty who were requiring homework systems with textbooks. And that has been accelerated by the pandemic, uh, by this, this push for getting faculty and students to use these inclusive access programs that just throw in homework systems, even if it's not necessarily something that the faculty uh, uh, you know, really want or need, but since it's there, may use. And to sum this all up, I, I, I think there are, are three big challenges to think about for the OER movement. You know, first, OER awareness and adoption are growing um, and OER initiatives work, but OER alone is not enough to do all of the things that we want to see, uh, or at least we're starting to see 
uh, the places where we need to build more open infrastructure, for example, in the area of homework systems and the kind of technology that that faculty are using in courses. And that bleeds outside the traditional definition of course materials and is going to need to push OER to intersect more with campus technology and other types of, of resources. The second challenge is just the reality that, that publishers are offering easy to implement solutions that appear to address the main problem that has driven advocacy, uh, or at least been, been the, the core of advocacy for OER over the last decade and a half. And then finally, <laughs> this issue with online homework systems that's just driving a shift in the product mix we're seeing in higher education. And I think we're seeing some of this play out in how OER initiatives are starting to change. Like we're starting to see this acronym of affordable and open educational resources emerge. And you know, no, no shade to any of these initiatives that 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 say that or use this term because you know what what you need to do on your campus to best serve your students is is what you should do. You know, we should be using all of the resources that are available to us to reduce the cost of course materials now. But I think affordability it comes back to that idea of uh, you know reducing the cost, not just the price. Affordability is about reducing the price. Open is about reducing the cost overall and making uh, higher education just better for students. So I, I think it's really, really important to keep grounded in the, in the uh, idea behind open educational resources and open sharing is the thing that educators do best. All right, so where do we go in the future? So I've shared a couple of the, the things that are keeping me up at night. I've shared the history of how we've gotten here. And uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how this is coming full circle and where I'm at. <laughs> so in many ways, the moment we're in right now, it feels a little bit like this moment where I was just with a bunch of students standing outside in the rain trying to tackle this really big challenge. You know, how do we change a system for sharing knowledge? How, how to change a, a system that is deeply entrenched in, in how textbooks are, are bought, sold, uh, procured on campus to one that makes sense in the 21st century, that's grounded in the idea of openness and sharing knowledge and collaborating, um, promoting you know, diversity of ideas, engaging many perspectives, uh, engaging students in building the materials and curriculum that they use in their courses. How do we shift from the expensive, traditional, entrenched uh, models of today into what I want to see in the future? And uh, I don't know <laughs> what the future holds, but I do have a few strategies that I encourage you to think about. So the first is that we need to start thinking about building the infrastructure needed to make OER easy to adopt at scale. The, the, you know, some of that is about the content, the tools we need, the training we need, the policies we need. And I think this means branching out more and collaborating with other areas on campus, uh, other movements and uh, other related open movements, open research, open source, open data, and, and thinking about how all of these things fit together. I think we also need to really deeply think about the political economy that's driving course materials and, and thinking about it as a problem that's traditionally solved by a retail model that was invented back when you had to literally print and ship a book to every student you wanted to educate. And thinking about how do we build this for the future? And, and this idea of homework systems becoming the norm, like if those, if that technology is required to complete homework, should it be part of tuition? Should it be provided to students? Should the in institution procure it on students' behalf rather than charging them a fee to turn in their homework. And then finally, I think we need to 
think about the value proposition of OER and how, how to make it bigger, how to make it connected to more pressing issues that, that we're facing. You know, the, the biggest question in my mind is like, what do we need to be advocating for right now that can open up the next 15 years of open education advocacy, the way that the early work that, that I talked about doing in, 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 in the mid 2000s opened up space for the, the amazing accomplishments the open education movement has achieved thus far. And I think part of this is just making it bigger, connecting it to student basic needs, connecting it to promoting uh, you know, student success and, and all of the challenges that are facing higher education right now, uh, thinking about the enrollment cliff that's coming in 2025 and how institutions are gonna need to make changes to stay relevant and recruit students. I think a lot of that's gonna involve online courses and uh, you know, how do we shift open to, to be the default for those. And as I'm thinking about these challenges, I wanna go back to uh, this article that I showed you at the beginning. Um, and actually in preparing for this talk, uh, I, I looked at the quote that I gave for this article and please tell me I have it, yes. Um, so <clears throat> the open textbooks that are out there serve as proof that it's possible to have high quality open textbooks being used in classrooms. They might just be the thing that will change the textbook industry for the better. And this is 2008 and like, it was true. Like the things that, that we were thinking and saying and envisioning now or then are true now. Uh, well, I guess in the sense that open education is a reality, don't know about changing the textbook industry for the better, but it's definitely changed and the narrative has changed and we are headed in a better direction right now. And I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just share my my closing thought with you all. Uh, I, I think sometimes we all may feel <laughs> a little bit like students standing out in the rain, uh, but even with the challenges ahead, the work so far, far that open education has accomplished shows that this vision is possible and we can do it. You know, we can build a world where everyone everywhere can access and shape and contribute to knowledge. And there's no reason why that's not possible. So uh, that's the future I see with open education and uh, hope you all walk away uh, feeling inspired to do what you can from where you are, wherever that is, whether it's large or small or a uh, 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 high level or low level to uh, make, um, uh, uh, change the world because even small actions uh, can. So I'm gonna stop there <laughs> and see, I, I haven't seen the chat, so I, I don't know where things are at, but happy to just use the rest of the time for questions. Thanks a lot, Nicole. Thank, thank you for taking us, you know, in your journey and, you know, in, <laughs> you know, from way back, really looking forward and looking back, you know. Um, so I just want to make sure that um, questions in the Q&A, you know, is answered. So we have um, Rachel Becker uh, posing a question. As someone who is passionate about reducing high textbook costs, when it wasn't a direct barrier to your education, how do you suggest we can tailor our OER adoption messages to faculty who believe OER isn't good and that no one else should adopt it? So uh, basically speaking to the greater good that OER can achieve versus individual academic freedom. And I see that speaks to your last point, right? When you said reframing our messaging about, about the value proposition of OER and connecting it to something bigger. So yeah, yeah your thoughts on that, Nicole. Yeah, so I think one important thing to just frame this answer is that we don't have to convince everybody. There are so many faculty out there that are willing to make changes and that are receptive to uh, you know, the many benefits that OER offer that you know, any individual faculty member, uh, you, know, you, don't, you don't need to change every single mind to have an impact. That said, <laughs> to address the question, I think it really depends on, on the individual. And 
you know, I've talked a lot about advocacy, but what I see advocacy as, as promoting your cause in a way that connects with other people. So in the work of advocacy, there are always two sides and thinking about where your audience is coming from and talking about what you care about in ways that makes them care <laughs> is the most important thing. So I think there are a lot of answers to this question. So I do think academic freedom is a really important one. So, you know, we're seeing the broader, you know, issues right now in, in education of, of uh, you know, banning books and shutting down, uh, uh, you know, discussions of race and sexuality and, and, and in college courses or high school courses, but if you're in Florida, maybe college too. And thinking about this as a way to ensure faculty can, can have ownership over the materials they use. Their students can have access to a multitude of resources and uh, uh, narratives and understand facts. We can also think about it uh, in the terms of the industry. You know, the industry is, as they move toward more digital, more enhanced technology, one size fits all is, is the best way to make a profit in that type of business scenario. And we're gonna start to see that happening. Uh, you know, Cengage has already said that they're gonna be reducing their number of, of titles. I believe, uh, I believe it was Cengage, one of the major publishers did. Um, so, uh, you know, as commercial course materials become one size fits all, OER offers that freedom to truly have something that is your own, that you can depend on, that isn't gonna get backlisted and to showcase your work. Uh, I also think that the uh, idea of uh, tenure and promotion, it's one that often comes up, that change is gonna happen over a long period of time. But, you know, as, especially on the research side of things, as open publication becomes normalized, more policies are put in place to support that, we'll have the opportunities to, to make those connections and make those changes. Thank you for that, Nicole. And I think we have one more. Um, homework platforms, <laughs> systems, um, you know, tools. Um, how do you see it and their role in promoting OER? I mean, this is a long discussion. And <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if we are able to like, you know, answer it as best as we can. But yeah, just just your thoughts. That's from Boris. Yeah, I would say that it is very important. There's so many, we've reached a point where the open education movement has grown so big that there are many ways in which there are large challenges we're all facing that I think there are opportunities for broader coordination and collaboration to address them collectively. And we've seen a lot of great work happening with organizations like Doers and CCCOER and Arlo that are helping to connect institutions and promote collaboration to tackle things like, you know, can we just create more open test banks or, um, uh, you know, support materials for OpenStax textbooks or other textbooks. And I, I think that's an opportunity that, that, that I see that can help address the, I guess, perceived problem that OER doesn't necessarily come with the homeworks platforms that traditional publishers do. This one I'm excited yeah. and maybe I can, you know, put in some of uh, the work that we're doing at the My OER Network. So um, what synergy or opportunities do you see with bridging OER concerns that touch K-12 and um, universities or colleges? You know, the siloing seems that they're not working together in many respects. So one of the things that we are intentional in, in doing um, here at the my um, OER network is to have that um, bridging, so to speak, of K to twelve community colleges and you know the four year universities. So essentially, K to twenty. Um, you know, we are, you know, intentional in, in partnering with our colleagues in the K-12 in doing so. And yes, it is challenging in so many respects because, you know, the model of them choosing learning materials is so different from, you know, what, what we do in higher ed. But, um, 
you know, I believe, I believe that can be done because the, the things that, um, you know, the, the graduates of K to 12 are the students that we welcome in our campuses, right? And so I think, um, really we have to, to to start and i'm just thinking you know college of education teacher education training should um encompass uh, professional development in in um open education and our colleagues at um, shout out to Gina Loveless of the Department of uh, Michigan Department of Education, doing a lot of professional development to our K to 12 um, teachers in order for them to become aware of um, OER and also, uh, you know, the Go Open movement and all that. So, um, Nicole, can you can you add some more? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, you know, we students experience education as a continuum, but for some reason our policies and practices are set up where there's a break. <laughs> and uh, thinking about more ways that, that we can bridge that gap and, uh, you know, I think dual enrollment is a great example. Thinking about career and technical education is, is something that, that, that happens at both levels. Uh, and teacher training uh, are all areas where, where there are opportunities for, for collaboration, so. It's, and you're doing amazing, amazing work in Michigan. Yeah, I mean, it's it's already like past 11 and I know we have- <laughs> Can I say one more thing? <laughs> yes, you know, yes. we, we wanted to like accommodate everyone's question, but um, unfortunately we have to end. Nicole, thank you so much for gracing our first day of the My OER Summit. Uh, please let's continue the conversation. Um, we have concurrent sessions starting at 11.10. And tomorrow we will have uh, Mahabali as our um, keynote, same time, 10 a.m. Eastern. And please, if you have not registered yet, Open Education Conference is next month. Is it next month? Oh, it's almost the end of September. It's a few weeks away. <laughs> a few weeks away, October yeah. 17 to 20. So we'll see you there and we'll continue the conversation. Thank you again, Nicole, and thank you to everyone who shared this space with us. And I would just like to say thank you to everyone here because you know I told my story in the piece of the open education movement's growth that that I saw and played a played a role in, but each of you got us here too. <laughs> So I want to say thank you to all of you and all of your colleagues and all of the people across the country and world that have been doing this. Um, uh, you know, it's it's one thing to be up here on the stage, but it's only possible to do this because of the broader field. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon.